Good morning. It is Sunday, October 29th, 2023, and I am Pastor Mark Dillon of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray that the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to know you to be redeemed by the blood of your sinless Son and to have the blessed gift of eternal life, a future with you in heaven forever and ever. And so we gather here in your name and in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to proclaim the truth of your word. And so we ask your blessing upon it that you would guide and direct my thoughts and my words, that you would open the hearts of the hearers to respond to the truth of that word. And we thank you for it. And so, Heavenly Father, most of all, we thank you for the great salvation that we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us, that by faith in him, we would receive the forgiveness of sins. We would receive eternal life. We would receive an eternity with you. And so we trust in you to be faithful as you are. We thank you for your word and what it reveals to us. And so we ask your blessing now. And we trust in you and you alone. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Throughout human history, the God of the Bible has decreed several divine arrangements, several economies or administrations, several different structures in which he has related to man and revealed his will for man throughout history at their present time. For example, when he talked to Abraham, he told Abraham, you're going to have a son. And Abraham believed him. He trusted him. And God reckoned that for righteousness. I'm not aware any place in scripture where Abraham had any awareness or any concept of the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead who would take on flesh, live in this world, and then be crucified for his sins. And yet God had reckoned him righteous simply on the fact that he had believed what God said. And so throughout all these administrations or arrangements, mankind has always been saved by grace through faith. But what that faith embraced has been different throughout all those arrangements. And never until the Apostle Paul was it ever proclaimed that you will be saved solely by grace through faith apart from works of any kind. And that faith is believing what God revealed to the Apostle Paul. And so in all of these various administrations, there's been a lot of truth given and it's all profitable for us it's all profitable for our instruction for our learning for our understanding but it's not all written to us and if you don't adhere to what the apostle to the gentiles the apostle paul says about study to show thyself approved unto god a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, you can get off on a lot of tangents, and they're all biblical, 
they're all true at a given time, but they, most of them will not directly apply to you. And that's where uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion today. There are a lot of people that talk about having great faith that we're going to focus on today, and uh, they follow Jesus. Well, Jesus, remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus never mentioned, I'm going to die on a cross. And when I die on that cross, I'm going to shed my blood for sin. And when I do that, you believe in me and I'll give you eternal life. He told the man to keep the commandments. And the man said, I've done all of that from my youth. And then Jesus told him, then go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. And the man left because he had great wealth. How many today follow that? Who in this room says, well, I've kept all the commandments? <clears throat> or who in this room has sold all they have and given to the poor to obtain eternal life? And in Paul's writings, we find out that neither one of those things could ever cause you to have eternal life. For it is by grace that we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So no matter what I can do in myself, it will not bring me eternal life. It's freely given, unmerited, undeserved by trusting in what Jesus Christ did on that cross. And so uh, the concept of dispensations is not well taught or well accepted in a lot of churches. But I would like to point out that it's very biblical and it's the Apostle Paul that's primarily the one that focuses on that concept, but Luke also talks about it, using different words, stewardship, and talking about a steward. But let's look at some that uh, Paul was chosen by God to be the dispenser of new truth, a secret, a mystery that had been kept hidden from before creation and now revealed and it's particularly for the Gentiles because the Jews had their body of truth for them and God had given them their Messiah and even though he was crucified, he still gave Israel the opportunity to repent of what they have done, to get baptized, to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and get baptized and they would inherit eternal life. And yet they continued, the vast, vast majority of Israel continued to reject the message of the 12 apostles. And so Christ comes back, strikes down the apostle Paul, and gives him a ministry and a dispensational arrangement. And so let's look at some of these. It's called the mystery in the gospel of the grace of God. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 16 and 17. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul was totally compulsed, compelled by the love of Christ, to preach the gospel that God made known to him. Now remember, the word gospel simply means good news. God is unveiling, making known a body of truth of good news that could never be known because it was never found in the scriptures until it was revealed to Paul. And so Paul says, I have nothing to glory in, for if I do not preach a gospel, whatever, if I do this willingly, 
In other words, if he embraces it, and he certainly did, he said, if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if, if, if <coughs> against my will, he's going to do it no matter what. But if he does it contrary to his own will, if he doesn't embrace it, if he just says, I got to do it, I'm commanded to do it, I don't want to, but I'm going to say it, then he's not going to get a reward. But regardless, he says, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. And you'll look there that of the gospel is in italics because it's not really there. And so what he's really saying is a dispensation, a stewardship, a body of truth has been committed to me. And so that's what he's proclaiming. In Ephesians 3 and 1 through 3, what Paul was preaching was totally new. The Jews hated him for it. The Jews wanted to kill him immediately. When he went up to Jerusalem, they had no idea what he was really preaching. And so he had to explain it to them. And so in Ephesians 3, he starts to talk a little bit about this. He says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, now notice he is, his message today, the gospel of the grace of God, for the entire world. Every human being needs to embrace this new administration. But Paul is going to be sent primarily to the Gentile world. Even though Jew and Gentile alike can only be redeemed in this administration or in this dispensation by believing the gospel that was committed to Paul's trust. And he goes so far in Galatians to say, if any man preach any other gospel than that you have received, let him be accursed. Even if an angel from heaven preach a different gospel, let him be accursed. There is one gospel for today. It's called the gospel, the good news of the grace of God. And so in Ephesians, he tells us that. He goes on to say, verse 2, Ephesians 3, 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. In other words, to the Gentiles. How that by revelation in the Lord Jesus Christ, he explains that in Galatia, all in the book to Galatians also. He says, I neither learned it, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ conveyed this body of truth to the Apostle Paul. And so he says here, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in a few words. Colossians 1, 25 through 27. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. I don't see how it can state it any more clearly or succinctly. The message the Apostle Paul was given is for, in this case, the Colossians, but it's for every human being today. The dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill, and that word fulfill means to bring to completion or to round out the full revelation of God. God had already, from Genesis 12, started to explain what he was going to do with his chosen people and their dominion one day of all the earth through their messianic king. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel, the anointed one. And one day he's going to come here to earth and destroy all of God's enemies, all of Israel's enemies, and establish Israel as the premier nation on the earth for a thousand years. And the Gentiles, when they see how God is blessing Israel, they too will want to know that God. And we're told 
that there will be 10 men from every language and tribe that will grab the cloak of a Jew. 10 nations, 10 men from other nations will grab the cloak of a Jew and say, take me up to your holy city for that is where God is. The Gentiles will come to God through the ministry of Israel. And so here, Paul goes on to say, verse 26, even the mystery, that is the fulfillment of the word of God, which is the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. I can guarantee you, and if you want to check it out, go do it. Go out and talk to people, and if they profess to be Christian, if they profess to believe in Jesus Christ, ask them if they can tell any, you anything about the mystery that Paul proclaimed. And he makes it pretty clear in Romans 16, 25, when he says, Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel, the gospel that God committed to him, now to him who's able to establish you by my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't stop there. We are established by the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery or the secret that was committed to Paul. And so again, it, it, it becomes so clear to those of us that have seen these things, that the Spirit of God has illumined our hearts to them, that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles that had a dispensation, a divine arrangement, committed to his trust to proclaim to the whole world. And so he goes on to say here in verse 26, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. It's now being clearly demonstrated to those who believe. In verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And here comes a wonderful statement, which is Christ in you. He's talking specifically to the Gentiles now. A glorious revelation of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. No other writer in scripture had any concept about how God was ever going to re redeem the majority of the human race. God's focus from Genesis chapter 12, 1 on, through the gospel, through the early part of the book of Acts, is all about God's dealings with his chosen people, Israel. And there is no promises made to the Gentiles. But now, Paul and Paul's gospel, here's part of this wonderful mystery, that Christ will live in the Gentiles. They'd never heard anything like that before. And, and those that believe, can you see why they rejoice with such praise and glory and thanksgiving? because they have been delivered from darkness, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then let's look at one more, Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. And what was that ministry? To testify the gospel of the grace of God. You will not find that gospel anyplace else outside of Paul's writings. It's very interesting that um, most people, when I wear my t-shirt about, for by grace are you saved through faith, oh, I love that message. And then when I show on the backside that all men might see the fellowship of the mystery, they just... I've never heard that before. I've never seen that before. And that word fellowship, there are some people that think that it actually might be that all men might see the dispensation of the mystery. It depends on 
whether it's economos or economy or something like that. But uh, in this particular passage, Paul talks about his ministry was to testify of this gospel of pure grace. In the previous dispensations, each had their instructions and requirements. And those who were to be redeemed under their distinctive divine administration were responsible to know and to obey, to live according to what God had revealed to them. That was the means to be saved, to believe whatever God had said to them and obey it. And in all of those dispensations, there was some kind of response required on behalf of those who believe. The, their gospel, their good news, was things like with Abraham, he was the chosen dispenser originally, and it went from Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, through Jacob's 12 sons, etc. And anybody who wanted to be part of God's revelation and be part of God's dealings with the human race, to have a relationship with the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what did they have to do? Get circumcised and keep the law. If you had faith, you would endeavor with all your heart. You would get circumcised for sure, and then you would try to your best ability to keep the law, and that would serve as a demonstration of your faith. Now again, they were still saved as everyone ever has been throughout all the Bible by the grace of God. Every human being since Adam sinned has deserved condemnation, has deserved punishment. But God in grace delivers men from that if they respond to faith in him. And so each person was responsible to divine... Uh, to the divine revelation God gave them. And so we look here, so the divinely chosen dispenser for today, Paul is that one who was chosen to dispense the truth of God for today. And Paul declares, and now at the present time, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. That's what matters today in the gospel of God's grace. It begins with faith, and that faith brings us a hope, an eager anticipation of our future in Christ. And the whole process is to be enveloped in love. And it's all come to us by the pure grace of God. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, 13 is where this comes. It says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. With the revelation of the mystery, the gospel of the grace of God, earthly promises, signs, wonders, and miracles are no longer the means by which we interact or relate to the God of the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul tells us, we live by faith. And that includes both getting life and living life. We live by faith. We are saved by faith, and we live by faith, not by sight. Faith has always been essential, but united with hope and enveloped in love, these three now continue. Faith, hope, and love is all that remain in the present dispensation. Now, they produce works. We are ordained by God onto good works. And so, the outworking of the faith, the hope, and the love are the works of God in his ministry and purpose for each individual believer. Having biblical faith is the product of the Holy Spirit's work 
as he illumines individual hearts and minds to the truth of the word of God as it was revealed particularly for us today through the Apostle Paul. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The people who have not believed Paul's gospel, the one that if anybody preaches any other, let him be accursed, if, if, if they have not been saved by the blood of Christ for the remission of their sins, believing that Jesus Christ was the sinless Son of God who bore their sins on Calvary, then they are blinded yet. The God of this age has blinded them. And Paul goes on, For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. For God, who said, Let the light shine out of the darkness, for God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so how did we see it? God made his light shine in our hearts. That's why uh, the truth of God declares that if we're to know God, it must come from him revealing himself to us. The gospel of the grace of God reveals the raw truth concerning the nature of man. Paul's gospel, even though we can find some intimations of it in other places, Paul's gospel is pretty raw about the nature of man. And so uh, Paul's gospel reveals the horrific conditions in which man was conceived and condemned. I better read the whole sentence again. The gospel of the grace of God reveals the raw truth concerning the nature of man, revealing the horrific condition in which he was conceived and the condemnation he deserves. Now, most people today have tried to euphemize the gospel and not really deal with its core issues. The gospel of salvation for today declares that man is at enmity with God in his mind, that he's a child of the devil, that he is living in darkness, and that the only deliverance from that is the blood of Christ. And we'll address some of those scriptures in just a second. But let's go on here. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, the blind having no faith are not aware, well, Paul doesn't say this, I am. The blinded, having no faith, are not aware of their true condition and their present condemnation. If you don't see, if you haven't been illumined to, to the marvelous truth that Jesus Christ died for your sins and you trusted him, you are virtually blind to the fact of your condition and your condemnation. But let's look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Now this is Paul again, primarily talking to Gentiles. But he says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work, in those who are disobedient. And when he talks about disobedient, he's not talking so much about behavior. He's talking about disobedience to God's revelation. You're not obeying what God has made known. All of us also lived among them at one time. That is the difference. It's not that we're any better than any other person in this world before God. We lived in the same conditions they did. All of us also lived among them at one time, 
gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. These believers were by nature objects of wrath. Every human being by nature is an object of the wrath of God. But this same gospel also reveals how God delivers his called ones, his chosen ones, by grace through faith. And so following this passage in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, comes Ephesians 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. When we were living that life of the previous three verses, God intervened and made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. It wasn't because you, uh, as often is misrepresented, you did repent, but it wasn't because you repented from the way you were living. The word repentance means to change your mind. And every believer living in blindness, living in a mindset that they're ignorant of the truth of God, the Spirit of God shines his light into your heart and he starts to reveal his truth to you and convinces you that it's true. And you believe it now. And so it is totally by grace that that happens. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, and there are a lot of coming ages apparently, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God's workmanship, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works. There's the outworking of this faith, hope, and love. We are ordained, God's, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ, ordained to do good works, which God hath prepared in advance for us. Romans 6, 3, 19 through 26. For we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Who is that talking about? Who was under the law? The Jews, Israel. The Gentiles were never given the law. They were never under God's law that he gave to Israel. And so he says, uh, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Jew or Gentile alike, Paul's gospel is for everyone. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight or his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And then he goes on to say, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace and again, that word freely is the same word that's used in the Gospels when it talks about they hated Christ without a cause. That word without a cause in the Greek is the same Greek word that's translated here, freely. 
And so in this passage, it's saying that we are justified without any cause in ourselves, but by his grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He could do that because of their faith. They were doing what God had said to them and he was reckoning that for righteousness. And they were believing what God had said. And so when they offered their sacrifices, the blood of those bulls and goats couldn't take away their sin. All it could do was cover it until the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary and the sins were washed away. And so it goes on to say here, he did this to demonstrate his justice because he left those sins go unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time today. So as to be just, the sacrifice has been met. God can be just because the price for sin was paid at Calvary. And the Lord Jesus Christ bore our sins and suffered our punishment in our place. And then he goes on to say that uh, to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Again, another experiment for you, if you ever want to just check me out to see if my experience it will align with what you experience, I would like to have you sometime just ask somebody that believes, that really believes that, uh, That's all right, Dot. You don't worry about. My wife was looking for her phone too. Uh, but ask somebody who professes to be a believer in Christ. Ask them what it means to be justified by God, like what it says right here. That the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And I'll guarantee you that you'll be amazed that if you find somebody that knows what that means it'll be astound me. If you can come back and say, I asked so-and-so that, and they told me exactly what the Bible says. Anyway, what does justify mean? It means to be declared or reckoned righteous. It doesn't mean you're made righteous. Right now, every one of us lives in a fallen human body. Every one of us right now has the flesh, we're saddled with a flesh that is sinful. And the only deliverance from that behavior is the Holy Spirit of God living in us who battles against that flesh so that we might live righteously. But to be justified by God means even though we sin, even though we fail this battle in the flesh, oftentimes we choose knowingly to sin. God still has declared us righteous in his sight because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to our account. And so we have no righteousness of our own, saved or unsaved alike. The difference being the unsaved have no righteousness on their account. We have the righteousness of Christ on our account because of our faith in he who died for us. And so when God looks at us, he doesn't see in the flesh a wonderful person. He sees a sinful human being, but he doesn't look at that anymore because you have been taken out of Adam, extracted from Adam, and baptized into the body of Christ. And so salvation is being in Christ, which comes by faith and, gra and grace alone. And so God was just and the justifier of those who have believed in Jesus. He is 
looked at each believer and said, your account has been paid in full by my son. I put all of your sin on him at the cross, and I have now taken his righteousness and put it on that account. And so when I see you in Christ, I see Christ in you. And that's why you're saved. That's why you're justified. Because God has done it on our behalf. And so going on here in Romans 5, and this is a little longer passage, 15 through 21. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if many died by the trespass of one man, what he's talking about here, he's going to, has told us earlier, for by one man, sin entered the world. Adam, that's the one man that destroyed the human race. And death, for by one man, sin entered the world. The, for by one man, sin entered the world. And death by sin. That's where death came from. Before Adam's sin, there was no death. But now because of Adam's sin, death entered the world. And he goes on to say, And death passed upon all men. Every human being is held accountable as Adam Sinned, and he is the federal head of the human race. In Adam, we all sinned. And sin passed upon all men in that all sinned. And death passed upon us. And so going on here, how much more did God's grace and the gift of, that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Those who trust Christ as their Savior have been delivered, not from physical death, but spiritual death. When Adam died, spiritual death enveloped every human being that would ever be born. We are born dead in trespasses and sins. We haven't committed them yet, and we don't become a sinner when we commit them. We commit them because we're already sinful in our nature because of Adam. We have no righteousness whatsoever. We're born sinful, and now by one man, the one man being Jesus Christ, the gift of God's grace, eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ has been received. And I'm not going to go much further there. Let's go to uh, Romans, 16, 15, uh, Romans 6, 15. Because this becomes important. Grace is so wonderful that people often say, well, what you're saying is then you can live any way you want. They got that right. You can live any way you want. But I'm not suggesting for a second that you ever should live the way you want to. That's Adam's nature in you. The things that cause you to want to sin come from Adam. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 7 when he says the things I want to do the Spirit of God is working in him to want to do things. He says, I don't do those. The things I don't want to do, the things that the flesh is compelling or designing for me to do, and I don't want to do them, but I still do them. Why is that? And he concludes, it's no longer I that's doing it. It's the sin that <coughs> dwells in me. And so he's trying to convey to us there's a deliverance in all of this for us, and it comes by faith. Truly believing that Christ lives in you now. And what is your response? Then I'm going to be better off. I'll try harder. I'll do more. That's the flesh's response. That's the religious response. The true response is, God, I can't do this. Only you can do it. You bought me with a price, the blood of your son. You have put your spirit in me to give me the power and the wisdom to do what I should do. Now, give me your grace and the faith to trust you. And then, that's why Paul says, we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's the toughest thing there is in the believer's life. It's easy. Not easy to... It has no value, even. 
But it's easy a lot of times to say, okay, starting today, I'm going to get up every morning at 6 o'clock and read my Bible for a half an hour. And so the next day, you wake up at 6 o'clock because you're committed to it, and you're going to read that Bible for a half an hour. And the next day, and people say, and that's good because you get in the habit of doing it. The Christian life is not habit. The Christian life is faith. Christ is our life. And we live it by trusting him and him alone. Oh, I can do it. I got this covered. This isn't that tough for me. And so I get up every morning and I, I feel like I'm really close to God because I'm doing all this for God. But is God doing it in me or is it me doing it in the flesh? And so it really goes good, maybe for a week, two weeks, three weeks, but someplace along the line, something in this dirty world gets in the way and I got a scheduled appointment, something comes up and I can't do it, and pretty soon I miss it, and then I miss it, and pretty soon it's been months since I did it, and I think, what happened? When God does his work in us, it's there. It's a result of your faith, and you live it moment by moment, whatever it is. And that's what we're going to talk about in the coming weeks. So I didn't ever think that we'd get through all of this, but I do want to cover the last part. In all of Paul's gospel, whenever he talks about a negative, such as, for the wages of sin is death, that's pretty negative. He adds a positive right behind it. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the negatives don't have to shock us or pull us back. We know the negatives if we're honest. We know that I deserve hell. So all I do now is focus on what God has done for me in Christ. And so it goes on in other places. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. I can't even think of it now. My brain's fried. Uh, Romans, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Looking back up here. Uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a pretty heavy negative. Every one of you people have sinned. You've fallen short of the glory of God. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it says you are justified freely. It's got nothing to do with the way you behave. You're justified freely by his grace. So if you study Paul's letters, every, almost every place where he talks about a negative, the one trust, one trust, by the act of one's trespass, it brought death for many. By the righteous act of one, it brought eternal life for many. It's just over and over again in his messages. And so what is the key? Well, before we get into faith, we need to get into where faith really begin. And so Paul wants to make sure his readers, those who follow him, understand this. Have you examined yourself? Do you know without any doubt that you're saved by grace through faith alone? Or are you still thinking like is commonly one of the most unbiblical and to people that have insight, foolish things that's ever said is God saves us and we're pretty bad. But there's that one little spot of good down in there someplace and God's going to chip away all the rest and get down to that one little good spot and then he's going to take that out and then he's going to build from there. That's the biggest joke in the world. We are totally depraved. There's no good in us. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So what does God do? He crucifies all of that and makes you alive with Christ. And he puts Christ in you. And now what he wants is to you to believe that Christ truly lives in you because you've examined yourself to see if you be of the faith, if you have believed the gospel, if you know these things, that you're in Christ is your salvation and that Christ in you is your sanctification. And now he's going to have Christ live his life 
through you. So when people see you today, when you walk in the spirit, when you walk by faith and not by sight, when people see you respond differently than they think anybody would respond, when they see you express thoughts that are contrary to the way so many people think today, they don't know it, but they are seeing Christ in you. And you realize it, if you're taught properly, that you get no credit for that. You will get a reward one day, but right now it's God working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So let's look at this. Uh, do you believe and trust that Jesus Christ died for you? First Corinthians, Paul says, 15.3, for what I received, I pass down to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Do you believe in trust? And here comes the kicker, though. This gospel of Paul won't tolerate pollution. Now, that's sort of a nasty thing to call it. But could a rose ever be a weed? I remember this from my freshman year in agriculture. What is a weed? A weed is any plant growing where it's not wanted. So any plant growing where it's not wanted meets the classification of a weed. Well, the truth of the matter, a lot of those weeds in their right place are glorious. But if you take something in its right place and put it where it doesn't belong, it loses its real importance. And that's what happens in the Bible. All the Bible is inspired of God. It's profitable for us. But it all needs to be kept and understood in its proper context. Who was God speaking to under what divine arrangement? And so for us today, our arrangement is Paul. You can take a truth from over here and here's a simple example. How many of your sins are forgiven? All of them, right? Will God ever hold a sin against you? You've been justified freely by his grace. You are delivered from the consequences of sin before God. Now, not in this world. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this world, if we live a certain lifestyle, we're going to reap a certain life response. It just happens that way. It's the nature of the thing. But if we, and I lost my thought. Somebody help me, where am I? i got to get done with this. My wife's going like this. Um, what I'm getting at is, okay, you can take something that's true under this divine arrangement, but you can't bring it over here and make it fit. It won't fit. And I'm going to show you one. People say, oh, I follow Jesus. I just talked to a wonderful lady. I don't know if she's wonderful, but I just really enjoyed a wonderful conversation with a lady. She's a believer, I think, but she's really confused. And I talked about Paul, and she says, well, you're so focused on Paul. I follow Christ. And I say, so do I. But I follow him the way Christ revealed Paul to tell us how to live. I don't follow him like he talked over here. You know what he said over here? He said, if you do not forgive your brother here on earth, your Father which is in heaven will not forgive you. Do I have to believe that today? Christ said it. It was true. It's totally true. But it doesn't fit in this arrangement because we're not in that arrangement. They, when Christ preached here, he came to fulfill the law. But that didn't mean he took it away. It was going to be changed. He was going to be totally changed. It was external for them. It was written on two, uh, two tablets of stone on both sides. It was a cold, heartless thing. Christ, under his divine arrangement, is going to write that law in their hearts. And they will know him from the least of them to the greatest of them. They will keep God's law perfectly. 
and God will be their God and they will be his people and from the least of them to the greatest of them they will all know him they have a glorious gospel but their gospel is not my gospel and what Jesus Christ said here on earth was all true it was all perfect it was all holy but he said a lot of things that aren't true for me in the Sermon on the Mount blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth I'm not going to inherit the earth I'm going to inherit heaven it's the gift of God for every member of the body of Christ they're going to have they're going to be raised out of the graves incorruptible for all eternity in a terrestrial body it's going to function on earth I have in my future a celestial body waiting for me that comes from heaven 2 Corinthians 5 expresses that so clearly it says if this earthly tabernacle in which we live is destroyed we have a building of God not built with human hands eternal in the heavens and we desire to be clothed with our house from heaven so my body and this is rightly dividing the word again that Paul talks about my body that's going to go to that grave someday should the Lord tarry is never going to come out of that grave again I'm going to go to be with the Lord the instant I die I'll be present with Christ I'll be unclothed which Paul didn't desire to be but he is he went to be with the Lord but I will go too one day if the rapture doesn't occur before that and I will live with Christ with my soul and spirit unclothed and then in an instant in the twinkling of an eye the dead in Christ will rise first that word rise doesn't mean go up it has to do with resurrection and resurrection has to do with awakening from sleep and it also means to stand erect and so all God, uh, Christ will come back with his saints which is the members of the body of Christ soul and spirit and in an instant we'll all stand erect with him with our bodies from heaven and then we which remain and are alive and remain will be caught up they will be changed in an instant and so shall we all be caught gathered together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we always be with the Lord we got to quit there but we'll pick it up next week about faith and the faith there's a big difference even though it's not always observable if you aren't aware of it there's a big difference between having faith personally and being in the faith personally so let's pray our dear Heavenly Father, what a glorious gospel you've revealed to Paul for us, Gentiles. He's your chosen vessel to take this message to us. I pray in our hearts that each one of us will embrace what your word says and search it out to see if it be so. And then, Lord, we praise you and thank you for this salvation that is ours in Christ, for your sanctifying work in our lives, having set us apart for your purpose and glory and for the future that is laid up for us in heaven. And so we give you all the thanks and the praise through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.